welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time it's the first in a series in which we're going to be upgrading an old desktop PC. Specifically in this first episode I'm going to introduce you to the older PC we're going to be upgrading. I'm going to discuss the range of options available when you want to upgrade an old desktop PC and I'm going to kick things off by adding some more memory. So let's go and get started. Right, here we have our old PC that we're going to upgrade, which as you can see is a mini tower. And it's got a dual core 2.8 gigahertz Pentium processor, two gigabytes of memory, and a 320 gigabyte hard drive with Windows 10 installed. And if you're wondering where did this PC come from, I purchased it on eBay for £54.95 delivered, which is about $75. And for reasons which will become clear, I believe this was manufactured in 2010 or 2011 and initially ran Windows 7. If we take a closer look at the front, we can see it's got a DVD writer, it's got two USB 2 ports, it's got front audio jacks, and it's got what appear to be two three three and a half inch bays and one three five and a quarter inch bay here on the front, although it's possible that the hard drive inside the machine is mounted behind one of these bays. If we flip the PC over and peek around the back, we can see we've got a standard power supply, although there's no indication of rating, there's no sticker on this power supply. And if we look on the I.O. panel, we find 3.5 millimeter audio connectors, an ethernet port for connecting to a network, we've got four USB 2 ports, we've got a VGA socket for connecting a monitor, we've got serial and parallel ports which are seldom used these days, and also we've got PS2 mouse and keyboard connectors, although a mouse and keyboard can also be connected to the USB 2 ports. And so in summary, here's the specification of our 10 year old PC. And for the average user, what is listed here is also a good description of the system. However, to upgrade a computer, we really need to gather more detailed information, particularly on the PC's processor, motherboard, and memory. And so I think it's now time to boot this thing up and then to look inside its case. Right, I've now got the PC all connected up and running, and here we are in Windows 10. And if you're wondering how long this PC takes to boot up into Windows 10, I did record and time the process. So if we speed on through, we can see that the boot time for the current specification is 47.1 seconds. Windows 10 is also perfectly functional on this system. It is a little bit laggy when you press buttons, things take a second to come up, as you can see here, but it does work. And it's not surprising there are a few lags because two gigabytes of memory is the minimum required to run Windows 10 64 bit. So that's why our system struggles here a little. And if we want to know more about this computer for upgrade purposes, we can go up to this PC and we can right click and bring up properties. And in here, we'll come up in a second. There we are. And on this screen, we can confirm that our installed memory is two gigabytes. We can see it there. And we can also see that our processor, our Pentium dual core 2.8 gigahertz processor, we can now discover is an E5500. And if we want to know more about our processor, which is always a good idea to learn about your system, we can go to the web. Let's run up Google Chrome. There we are. Let's give it encouragement. Come on, computer, launch Google Chrome. You can do it. Of course you can do it. Always having a think, oh, I think we have activity. I've often threatened to learn to play the mouth organ to cover moments like this in the video with a little bit of music, but uh, no, it will just have to do with me wittering on. And uh, here we are, we are arriving in Google Chrome. More memory on this computer as we will be fitting will make a big difference in performance of things like the Chrome browser. That is at least the idea. Anyway, we've got here now, so let's just uh, go up there and search for a Pentium E5500. If we do that, the first page we find is normally the one to the arc.intel.com website. It is with a list of processor specifications. And if we go there, we should find out more about our processor. Always good to learn about your processor. Yes, here we are. Here's the Intel Pentium 
E5500. Lots of information about it down here, some of which will be useful to us maybe later in this series. But right now I'll just point out we know that this was launched in the second quarter of 2010, which is why I believe this computer was built in 2010 or 2011. Even more important to us in terms of upgrading is to learn about our motherboard. And to learn about our motherboard, we'll go down here into the taskbar, click in the search box, and I'll type a system information. I've already started typing it already there before, but we'll go into that, go into system information. And this should show us more detailed information on our system, not least in the system summary, which is just refreshing here. There we are. We can see here that our baseboard manufacturer, our motherboard manufacturer is Gigabyte, and that the motherboard itself is a G41 MTD3. And so again, we can go to the web. I've already done a search for this. I've got it bookmarked over here somewhere. Let's find that motherboard. There it is, and it's loaded up. Panda, that's the motherboard we will see inside our case very shortly. And there's all sorts of general information here. Not least we can see this computer was built for Windows 7, which was the dominant operating system at the time it was made. But if we go into specification over there, we'll find out a bit more detailed information. This is the stuff we really need to know. Lots of information here we'll be using across this series. But particularly for this video, it's good to see information on the memory, where we can see this board has got two DDR3 DIMM sockets and supports a maximum of eight gigabytes of memory, and it uses 800 or 1066 megahertz DDR3 modules. Also down here, we can see other things that will be of relevance to us across this series, particularly expansion slots on the motherboard. You can see we've got a PCIe times 16 and times one slot. We've also got two PCI slots, although they're unlikely to be of use to us with modern hardware. And we've also down here got information on storage on the system, where you can see we've got an IDE connector for supporting up to two IDE devices. We won't be using any of those, but we've also got four SATA ports, and these are three gigabit SATA ports, which means these are SATA 2, as opposed to SATA 3, which runs at six gigabits a second and is found on more modern motherboards. But SATA 2 is still perfectly decent, and it's good to see we've got plenty of drive options available. So, having found this information, we can now update our machine specification, which will be a useful guide for upgrade planning. Greetings. It's now time to give Mr. Screwdriver some exercise because we're going to open up the PC's case. And specifically, we're going to remove the PC's left side panel, which is almost always the one that provides direct access to the motherboard, and which on a PC of this age often has a vent in the side. So all we need to do here is to remove two back screws, so I'll get on with that. There we are, and then in theory, we just push this like that, lift it out, there may well be a vent on the inside on a case of a PC of this age like that, and straight away we can see the computer's motherboard, which looks just like the one in its picture. The biggest thing on the motherboard is this, this is the cooler, the fan, and the heatsink on top of the processor, so the heart of our computer, our Pentium E5500, is under here, and then below it down here we have our two RAM slots, our two memory slots, and only one of these is occupied, which is not what I expected. I thought we'd have two one gigabyte modules, not one two gigabyte module. Down here we have the computer's three and a half inch hard drive, and it's great to see it's mounted down here, not behind some of the front bays we were looking at earlier. It's down in this drive cage. There's lots and lots of spaces to mount drives in this system. You could build a nice small server, or a NAS in this case, with all these hard drive mounting options. And talking of hard drives, let's just run through the connectors for storage on the board. Down here we can see the IDE connector, which I mentioned earlier for connecting older drives to board, hard drives or things like optical drives. And if you're using that connector, you'd use a ribbon cable like this to connect in the drives. But here, the hard drive and also the DVD drive up here are connected to two of the four SATA ports on the computer's motherboard with the SATA interface using a much thinner cable, as you can see. Just up from the SATA port, we then find the PC's expansion slot in which we could plug in expansion cards. Here are the older PCI slots. Here are the newer PCIe slots, the 16 times slot where you'd often plug in a graphics card and the one time slot where you might plug in all kinds of other cards as we'll be doing later in this series. 
And if you want to know more about PCIe cards, I've got a video all about that topic. Finally, in the corner, we find our power supply, which fortunately has got a label on it on the inside. So we can see here, this is a 355 watt power supply. And I'm very pleased to see that it connects to the motherboard via a 24 pin ATX connector rather than the 20 pin ATX connector. And it also connects by an additional four pin 12 volt connector down here. And this is significant because it means that these are the connectors for a power supply we'd find on a modern motherboard. So it means we could replace the motherboard in this computer with a new motherboard and potentially still use the same power supply. Talking of which, when considering an upgrade, I always think of a PC as possessing three things. The first is its motherboard, its processor, and its memory. I think of that as one unit. The second thing a PC possesses is then the rest of its hardware, the case, the power supply, case fans, drives, things like that. And then the third thing a PC possesses is its operating system. And if we think of a PC in this fashion, we can consider possible upgrade options. And the most dramatic upgrade option would be to replace the motherboard and the processor in the computer. And normally if you're working in an old PC, that means replacing the memory as well. And this will allow us to implement a very significant upgrade. We could give this old PC a brand new PC specification. However, almost certainly if we did replace the motherboard and the processor, we would also have to buy a new copy of Windows because most desktop PCs come with what's called an OEM or Original Equipment Manufacturer version of Windows, but it's only licensed to work on the first motherboard they're installed on. And this therefore means that replacing the motherboard, the processor, and the RAM in the computer can be an expensive upgrade option, although it does allow you to reuse lots of other components like the case and the power supply and things like that. And indeed, I'll be doing a motherboard replacement later in this series. Less dramatically and less expensively, almost all other upgrade options will involve us keeping the same motherboard and processor. And the two most important things to consider are either a memory upgrade or upgrading a hard drive with an SSD. Both of these upgrade options should make the system more responsive and which is better depends on preference and budget. However, here, given that this PC has only got two gigabytes of RAM, I would suggest that adding more memory is by far the best initial upgrade to perform and should make Windows 10 run a lot more smoothly. Inserting new RAM is a quick and straightforward process. So the biggest task in any memory upgrade is selecting the correct type, capacity, and speed of modules to be fitted. Today, most desktop PCs use dual inline memory modules or DIMMs that may be either DDR4, DDR3, DDR2, or DDR. DDR stands for double data rate, with each new RAM generation executing more data transfers per computer clock cycle. So, for example, DDR4 RAM runs more quickly than DDR3. If you want to learn more, you can watch my video explaining RAM. As we've already established, the PC we're upgrading uses DDR3 memory modules and has two slots into which up to 8GB of RAM can be fitted. From the motherboard specification, we also know that modules running at either 800 or 1066 megahertz are supported. However, today it can be hard to buy new RAM that operates at this speed, and hence it's worth noting that it's okay to fit RAM that has a higher speed rating, as it will happily run more slowly. Indeed, you may have noticed that the DDR3 module currently fitted in the PC we're upgrading is rated at 1333 MHz and almost certainly is not the original memory. While installing just one RAM module should work, for optimal performance, modules should be fitted in pairs, ideally of the same capacity, speed and brand. In a two RAM slot motherboard, it's obvious where both modules should be fitted. However, on a board with more slots, they are normally color coded to indicate where a pair of modules should be inserted if you're not using all available slots. In our PC, the most sensible RAM upgrades to consider are to fit either an additional 2GB module alongside the existing one to give us 4GB in total, 
or to fit two new 4GB modules to give us 8GB of RAM. Other combinations should also work, such as adding an additional 1 or 4GB module in the free slot. However, installing two modules of the same capacity is always a safer bet and will maximise performance. Here, I've decided to fit two new 4GB modules to give this PC the maximum RAM we are certain its motherboard will support. 8GB should also make Windows 10 operate a lot more smoothly. However, even upgrading from 2GB to 4GB would make a considerable difference and is definitely worthwhile. The RAM I purchased is this kit of two 4GB DDR3 modules from Computer Bay, which I purchased for £32 and with similar kits costing about $32 in the United States. Like the 2GB module already in the PC, these RAM modules are rated at 1333 MHz but will happily run at a lower speed. When purchasing RAM for a desktop PC, be careful to buy full size DIMMs and not the small outline or SODIM modules used in laptops and a few small form factor desktop PCs. When handling RAM modules, it's a good idea to wear an anti-static wrist strap like this one, which needs to be attached to a grounded metal object, such as a radiator. If you don't have a strap, touch a grounded object before handling your RAM, and be careful not to do things that build up static electricity, like dragging your feet across a carpet. To fit our RAM, we first need to remove the existing module. We can do this by pulling back the retaining clips there and there, and it should lift out nice and easily, like that. Next, we can take one of our new modules and slot it into the slot, and you'll see because of the slot on the module, it only goes in one way round. If you can't get it in, move it around, put it in the right way round, click it into place. You can hear it click, the retaining clips lock it into position. And we can now take our second module, we'll have to pull the clips back before we put it in, like that. Again, slot it in, into the slot like that, nice and easy, clicks into place like that, and our PC has now got 8GB of RAM. Before putting the case back on and powering things up, it's always worth making absolutely certain everything's okay, make sure the RAM is properly pressed down into the socket, the retaining clips are properly clicked into place, as a common reason for RAM not to work is if it's not seated properly in its motherboard slot. Guess what? Here I am back again in Windows 10, as you can see, all booted up, and the machine is now more responsive than it was. If I go to a menu, it just comes up a little bit faster than it did before. It's, it's very difficult to get across the, the feel of a slightly more responsive system, but this certainly is a more responsive system than we had previously. And if we go to uh, this PC and do properties, massively quicker to get there. And as you can see, we've now got our eight gigabytes of memory. So this has been a, a successful memory upgrade. If you're wondering about what it's done to boot time, it hasn't changed it very much, but I have tested it as you can see here. So if we speed on through, you'll see that we boot in 45.5 seconds with eight gigabytes of RAM compared to 47.1 with two gigabytes. And I have done this test several times. These are the lowest boot times I can record. I guess we should also just go to Google, run up the Chrome browser and go to a web page. That was faster than we did last time, wasn't it? That's a real improvement. And the reason a computer is running more quickly with more memory is that when Windows is low on memory, it has to use what's called virtual memory. It has to shift data it will be holding normally in RAM to a file on its hard drive. And shifting data to the hard drive and back is slower than keeping everything Windows needs in traditional memory which is why a computer with more RAM becomes a more responsive system. So there we are. We've taken our old desktop PC and improved its performance by adding some extra memory. In the next video in this series, we're going to continue the upgrade process by upgrading the hard drive with an SSD, which would give us another significant performance improvement. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.